I'm Lexi McClamont. I'm a research scientist with Agriculture Victoria. And today I'm explaining an irrigation budgeting tool that's available from the department for pear orchards in the Goulburn Valley. I'm going to be explaining some of the information inputs that are needed to go into that tool and showing you how it can be used to help plan irrigation management strategies for a season under different scenarios and how it can also provide a guide to scheduling within a season. The budgeting tool is an Excel workbook. There are two worksheets in it, one being this seasonal water budget and the second being the scheduling plan. Uh, so the seasonal water budget is basically calculating orchard water use and from that determining what your irrigation requirement would be. Now each of the um, grey columns uh, shows you where data is either required to be input or, or can be altered so that you can investigate different scenarios and what the impacts of say a particularly dry year could be um, or a particularly wet year on your um, irrigation requirements. Likewise with the scheduling plan there's certain information that you put in that's specific to your orchard and uh, you can run a few different scenarios there to see what the impact of uh, a different um, emitter rate or uh, uh, run time would have on, on your scheduling within the season. When you schedule irrigation, whether you're doing it purely by experience or with some form of decision support, you're taking into account a whole range of factors. Uh, from the weather conditions to the crop type and in that you might consider the fruit growth stage and the size of the trees. You're taking into consideration the understory conditions and the soil type, your uh, emitter type, so your, your wetting pattern. All these things are going to influence when and, and how much you irrigate. So the irrigation budgeting tool um, takes typical values for a pear orchard in the Goulburn Valley along with some orchard specific information that you can enter and provides you with a prediction of orchard water use over a season. The irrigation budget is a monthly budget and the two main outputs in this sheet are the orchard water use and the irrigation requirement. And they're calculated in millimetres and megalitres per hectare. The irrigation requirement is obviously less than the orchard water use because of rainfall during the season and also soil reserves from winter rainfall. Next, I'm gonna step through each of these gray columns and explain those. Um, these are spaces where you can enter your own data or alter the data that we've pre-filled and the white columns automatically calculate from that information. The first column is reference crop evapotranspiration and the values that are already input into the spreadsheet are those for long-term average at Tatura. Um, so anywhere in the Goulburn Valley, your long-term average is going to be fairly similar to these values here. Reference crop evapotranspiration, what's that? Well, it's calculated from solar radiation, wind speed, humidity, and temperature data. So your weather data. Uh, but it is a calculation of the water use of a reference crop. And that reference crop is full cover grass of a, of a particular height. Um, if you're interested during the season to see what the daily ETO values are compared to the long-term averages, this website is the place to go, basically. Um, you can click on Victoria, the Victorian tab, look up your nearest weather station. Um, although for those in the Golden Valley, I would tend to look at the Tatura weather station rather than the Shepparton weather station simply because the Shepparton weather station is at the airport, whereas the Tatura weather station is at the Tatura smart farm. So it's a little more reflective of orchard conditions. 
This slide shows the long-term reference crop evapotranspiration for the Goulburn Valley. The blue open symbols show the long-term values. And I've also plotted uh, each of the last four seasons. Now, generally, there's, there's pretty little difference um, for the monthly totals between seasons. You might recall a few summers ago, we had uh, heat wave conditions in January, and you can see a bit of a higher ETO response in those two seasons compared to the other couple. Um, generally, there, there's not a huge shift um, in ETO. Uh, it is something that you might be interested in um, altering in the spreadsheet just to see what effect it does have. Um, and obviously within a season, you have periods of hotter, drier conditions and wetter, milder conditions, and you adjust your irrigation scheduling accordingly. But in terms of a, a seasonal budget, there's usually not a lot of difference between seasons. Once we have the reference crop evapotranspiration, we then need to adjust that to convert from the water use of grass to orchard water use. And the next two columns help us to do that. So the effective area of shade column helps us to convert from grass water use to tree water use. And the understory coefficient calculates the transpiration of the understory and the soil evaporation. To convert reference crop evapotranspiration, so the water use of grass, to the water use of your trees, you need to take account of several factors, um, including the size of the trees, the training system, so for example, whether you have a vertical hedgerow type system or a chatura trellis type system, the planting arrangement, so your uh, tree and row spacings, the row orientation, whether it's north-south or some different orientation, and the density of the canopy. Um, all these factors basically are influencing how much radiation your trees are intercepting, and that's a major driver of tree water use. What is effective area of shade and how do we measure it? Well, it's the fraction of the orchard floor that's shaded throughout the day. Um, a simple calculation then is the width of the shade band divided by the row width. And this is a nice simple example. In a vineyard, we have a continuous band of shade down the row. In some orchards, you'll have discrete trees. So there'll be light between shadows or you might have windows um, in the canopy, light windows in the canopy. You need to adjust for that uh, light as well. Um, and obviously that shade pattern is going to change throughout the day. So we measure it three times of the day to account for that diurnal pattern. And we take the measurements at solar noon, which in the Goulburn Valley ranges from about uh, 115 to 130 and that's Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time. So solar noons when the sun's directly overhead is the simplest way to, to work it out. And then we take measurements about three and a half hours before and after that time. The example uh, shown here, they're all um, on a north-south row. And the Chatura trellis example works out at about 55% effective area of shade, whereas the vertical hedgerow and the bars both work out at a, in the low 40%. And they're probably fairly typical uh, ranges for pear orchards in the Golden Valleys, so from about 40% EAS to 60% EAS. These photos also give an indication of what your effective area of shade might be. You can compare these to what your orchard look like, looks like. Um, for a Chatura trellis with a fairly dense canopy, 80% is possible, uh, but 70% is generally considered quite high. 
This figure shows the seasonal pattern of effective area of shade for a mature pear orchard. It starts at around 20% at full bloom and in this example increased to a peak of 60% where it remained steady for the remainder of the season. What that means is that you can take a single estimate of effective area of shade once leaf up is completed and you needn't worry about that value changing for the remainder of the season. Conversion of ETO, reference crop evapotranspiration, to tree water use isn't a straight multiplication of effective area of shade and ETO. There is an adjustment factor and the horticulture team at Tatura through many measurements has shown that that factor for mature pear trees is 1.1. In other words, pear tree water use equals 1.1 times effective area of shade times reference crop evapotranspiration. Now that calculation is embedded in the irrigation budget, so you don't need to worry about it, but adjusting the EAS values so that they're appropriate for your orchard will give you better predictions of orchard water use. Just a brief aside, um, on the left here, you can see some of the traditional tools for measuring effective area of shade for research purposes. Um, some of our current research is looking at the potential use of sensor-based, uh, plat commercial sensor-based platforms to convert LiDAR measurements to predictions of effective area of shade for orchards. Um, if this is successful, it'll enable spatial maps to be generated for orchards without growers having to actually go out and try and judge for themselves um, what is the typical EAS for a particular block or, or blocks, which would make life a lot easier in terms of fine tuning your irrigation. Moving on to the understory coefficient. So again, this is providing an adjustment, a conversion from reference crop ETO to the water use of your understory. The factors that will influence um, the understory coefficient are the wetted area, that's the particularly important one, and that will be determined by the uh, your emitter type. So whether you're using microjets, for example, or drip. Uh, also factors are soil texture and water content. Um, th those two factors will affect the rate at which water evaporates from the soil surface. The understory components, so whether you're grassed or bare, that will have a, an effect on um, transpiration and evaporation. And also shading. Um, these photos show some very young pear trees that are not providing any shade. Um, over these wetted patterns, but you can imagine with a um, mature orchard, the shading provided by your trees will counteract to some extent the evaporation and transpiration of your understory. Now these photos aren't of a pear orchard, but they do contrast uh, a couple of different scenarios. So on the left, we have an orchard that's microjet irrigated, um, within the season, they have a grassy uh, interrow that will be transpiring water and um, underneath the row you can see quite a bit of light still. So those large wetted patterns from the microjets um, will, will not be as shaded as in the orchard on the right um, where it's actually drip irrigated. Um, those drip wetting patterns are heavily shaded through the day and um, the interro um, won't be transpiring uh, because it's quite bare. A useful guide for your understory coefficient is that it's the fraction of the understory that is well watered and sunlit. And this table gives some examples. Uh, so early in the season, you'd expect to have a large wetted area because of winter and spring rainfall and very little shading and an understory coefficient of 0.7 is pretty reasonable. 
mid-season, your wetted area is going to contract and as the leaf up occurs and you get into that um, mid-season plateau of effective area of shade, you'll have increased shading. So for drip at that time, uh, an understory coefficient of 0.1 to 0.15 is uh, are typically used. Now, some publications do suggest values even lower than that, um, but for a pear orchard in the Goulburn Valley, you're probably pretty safe using an understory coefficient of about 0 0.1. Uh, if you've got microjets, it's really going to depend on the type of microjets you have and what the radius of their um, spray circle is. So from that, you can work out the area of the wetted pattern and knowing your, your, your emitter spacing, you can then work out what fraction um, of the orchard floor is being wet. I'll just recap quickly. So we have the long-term ETO, in other words, the water use of grass, the effective area of shade and the understory coefficient with these two columns converting the long-term ETO to your orchard water use. Now, in this example, I've said I have a, an orchard that reaches an EAS of 55%. Um, and you'll notice the last couple of entries, we're dropping that value back um, as we reach the end of the season and leaf function starts to decline and, and eventually leaf fall begins to happen. And for the understory example, you'll see I start at, at 0.7 at the beginning of the season, drop it back, and evidently I'm using drip because I'm using 0.1 then for the remainder of the season. So we'll move on now to the next few columns that adjust orchard water use back to irrigation requirement. The first column, um, the, the rainfall column, is again the long-term average values for, for Tatura. Not all rainfall is considered effective. In other words, it's not all going to contribute to your water balance. A general rule is that an event has to be greater than 10 mils to be considered effective. And even then, we only consider 75% of those falls, of, of the volume in those falls to be effective. Um, the balance sheet here is calculating 75% of whatever's entered, so you don't have to worry about calculating the effective rainfall so much. But if you're entering your own data, for example, you'd really only be adding up the values, the rainfall events greater than 10 mils. The soil water reserve. Now this is the water held by your soil uh, available for plants to uptake at the start of each month. And this value depends on your soil type and the, the depth of your soil profile. And it's also calculated from the rainfall and water use in the previous month. This value of 54 millimetres assumes that you have the clay loam soil type that's commonly used for pear orchards in the Goulburn Valley. And it also assumes that you have a, a rooting depth, that the, the bulk of your roots are in the top 80 centimetres of soil. Uh, and, and lastly, it assumes that you've had a wet winter and spring. So this 54 millimetres is, is at capacity for the soil water reserve. If you've had a particularly dry spring, you might want to adjust that value down. Likewise, if you have a different soil type, you'd need to adjust that value. We don't always want to provide irrigation to meet the potential water use, either because we don't want excessive vegetative growth or perhaps because we don't have the water available to us. And we know with pears that it is safe to apply deficit irrigation at certain stages of the season without impacting yield. Uh, so this stress coefficient column lets us investigate the impact on irrigation requirement of applying different levels of deficit irrigation during the season.
This figure illustrates the main phases of shoot and fruit growth for pears throughout a season. The green line being shoot growth and the red line being fruit growth. So you can see in this first phase at the beginning of the season, you have some shoot growth and the fruit are in a cell division phase. Next, you move on to a period of rapid shoot growth. And at that same time, the fruit are going through a slow growth phase. In late November, early December, that shoot growth terminates and the fruit enters into a period of rapid fruit growth. So in terms of irrigation, um, at this time of the year, in the first phase, the irrigation requirements and um, where you'd set your stress coefficient really depends on the winter spring, spring conditions. At this time, you're, you're wanting to allow the soil to dry out to an extent, down to about 200 kilopascals. Um, so if you've had a wet winter and spring period, you may not need to apply irrigation at all during this time. You may just want to let that soil begin to dry out um, so that when you enter the second phase of rapid um, shoot growth, you've got some capacity to control that vegetative vigour um, through regulated deficit irrigation. And then Obviously, when you enter the final phase where you have rapid fruit growth, um, you want to be applying irrigation at the full um, amount. And so your stress coefficient at that time, um, you'd use a stress coefficient of, of one, and that basically means you're not applying deficit irrigation in that later phase. So September, October, your stress coefficient may be 0.3 if you're wanting to dry out the soil profile or if you've had a, a dry winter, um, you might use a, a higher stress coefficient. In November, um, a stress coefficient of 0.3 could be a good starting point and you'd look at the shoot growth and the soil conditions to get an idea of, of whether that factor was actually high enough to be controlling your vegetative growth uh, or if the soil was drying out uh, too much. And yep, of course, in that rapid fruit growth stage, as I said, you don't want to be stressing the trees. You want to be applying water so that that potential fruit growth can occur. Uh, after harvest, with pears, you can cut back the water quite severely. But again, you'd be taking into consideration the seasonal conditions. So how dry is the soil at that time of year and uh, what your mite pressure is. You don't want to overstress the trees if you have uh, a level of, of mite, pressure, mite pressure that could cause uh, damage. To recap again, we have our orchard water use calculated by the budget and we're subtracting the rainfall and the soil reserve and adjusting for any deficit irrigation that we might want to apply and the spreadsheet's calculating then the irrigation requirement. I forgot in the previous slide to mention um, one more thing that you might consider with this stress coefficient and that is your rootstock. So for example, if you have BP1 rootstock that we know seems to be less tolerant to extremes in soil water content, you, you might want to take that into consideration when you're setting these stress coefficients. I'll give an example now of changing some of this input information to look at different scenarios. You'll notice at the moment we have an irrigation requirement of just under four megalitres per hectare. But let's say we miss out on summer rainfall and you'll see that irrigation requirement increased to 4.6 megalitres a hectare. Likewise, you might want to consider the effect of using microjets with a large wetting pattern. And you can see that by changing that understory coefficient, the irrigation requirements now increase to seven and a half megs per hectare. Uh, or conversely, um, if you 
have a different training system that intercepts less radiation, which will also affect your production potential. So not really necessarily a desirable outcome, but you can see the effect on irrigation requirement there as well. Um, and any of these gray cells, you can alter the, the input data and see what effect that would have on your monthly and seasonal irrigation requirements. Now we're moving on to the second part of the workbook to the irrigation scheduling plan worksheet. Um, if you're doing multiple of these for different blocks, you could enter your block description on the left hand side here. Uh, but this information on the right, that's the important information to enter correctly. Um, the calculations in this spreadsheet are picking up on these values here. So your tree and your row spacing, the rate of your emitter output and your emitter spacing. Now, when your irrigation system's been designed originally, it will have taken into account a whole range of things, including uh, your pump capacity, the area of orchard that you have to irrigate, um, and the sort of the, the time that you have to be able to irrigate that entire area, um, as well as the environmental conditions. So, what is the infiltration rate of your soil? What, what is the wetting pattern of your um, emitters going to be? And all that will have um, been taken into consideration uh, when working out an appropriate runtime for, for different blocks. And you can see in this example, um, I'm starting with a runtime of two hours early in the season, but I know that two hours, a two hour runtime won't meet my requirements in, in summer. So I've increased my runtime in summer to six hours. The remaining columns in this spreadsheet pick up on this information that you've entered up here and also information in the previous spreadsheet. So the evaporative demand, the ETO, the effective area of shade, the understory coefficient, all that information in the previous spreadsheet feeds into this one to uh, perform these calculations. Uh, the stress coefficient column is carried over. It's useful to have that as a reminder of what you've set those stress coefficients to. If you want to change them, you change them in the previous worksheet and it brings them automatically into here. The output of interest is this irrigation interval. Uh, so it's telling you how, how, how frequently that, well, the number of days between irrigation events based on the typical information that you've entered in this worksheet and the previous one. So a value of one, for example, here in December, means that you're irrigating with that runtime of six hours every day, typically. Uh, a value less than one means that you need to be applying that runtime more frequently than once a day. And greater than one means that you're um, leaving a number of days between irrigation events. So for example, in October, where that value is 1.4, Basically, that means that you're irrigating, say, twice every three days on average. So while the uh, scheduling budget, the first worksheet, is a decision support for planning and investigating different scenarios over the entire season, this spreadsheet then is a, is a bit of a decision support for within the season. It's, it's giving you an idea of what your typical irrigation frequency would be. Um, during the season and obviously in practice it's going to change because you'll have rainfall events where you uh, delay irrigation for a few days in response to that or you'll have heat waves where you increase your runtime or your irrigation frequency. I'll give a demonstration now of setting different emitter rates and spacings and runtimes and what effect that has on your irrigation interval. Now, I have already changed in the previous uh, spreadsheet the understory coefficient because now I'm going to change from using drip to 
uh, micro jets. So I've already changed that understory coefficient in the previous um, uh, worksheet to increase it from 0.1 to 0.3. And now I'll change uh, the runtime. You just saw me change the emitter rate to 30 litres an hour and the emitters are spaced two metres apart. And you can see the effect that those changes have had on the interval between irrigation events. I haven't covered decision support from sensors within the orchard at all in this presentation, but we are doing a video in future uh, covering that topic. So watch this space. That concludes this presentation. If you have any questions at all, please contact me. The email address is provided. I'm more than happy to talk over the phone, but email is the easiest way to trade numbers. Finally, I would like to thank Agriculture Victoria for its ongoing support of PEAR research. I would also like to acknowledge that this video is an output from the PIPS3 program and that the project has been funded by Port innovation via the Apple and Pear Growers Levy and the Australian Government Funds. So thank you to those organisations as well.